Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's lecture from our new series, Passport to Peru. My name is Kiernan, and I'll be your host on behalf of Peru for Less and Inca X for Travel. Today's session is focused on the land of the Incas with our expert, Kim McQuarrie. I firstly would like to thank everyone watching on Zoom and Facebook today for joining us. We're so happy to share this event with you. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Mr. McQuarrie will be answering some questions from the audience after the event. So please feel free to submit your questions for him at any time during the lecture. And for those joining us on Zoom, just submit your questions into the Zoom Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom browser. For those of us on Facebook Live, just submit your questions into the Facebook Live comment section. Mr. McQuarrie will be happy to answer your questions. So please, please do ask them. We would love to answer as many as we can at the end of the event. At the end of the event. Also afterwards, be on the lookout for an email from us with the link to the recorded lecture. We are so pleased to welcome our expert, Kim McQuarrie, a four-time Emmy-winning documentary filmmaker, best-selling author, anthropologist, and conservationist. He has produced and directed several direct documentaries for television channels such as Discovery Channel, PBS, FX, Fox, and others. Mr. McQuarrie is the author of four books on Peru and has lived here for five years. During that time, he lived with a recently contacted tribe of indigenous Amazonians called the Yora. It was experience, his experience filming a nearby group of indigenous people whose ancestors still remained and remembered their contacts with the Inca empire that ultimately led him to investigate and then write his best-selling book, The Last Days of the Incas. Today, he'll be discussing the pre-Columbian period in Peru with insights into the mighty Inca empire and their successes leading up to the Spanish conquest. Hi, Kim, thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, Kieran, Kieran uh, great to be here. Thank you for the introduction. Yes, we're so happy to have you here. Uh, before we get started, I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about what originally made you interested in Peru and, and traveling to Peru. Uh, yeah, and, and um, <clears throat> I got interested in Peru because I was interested in going down to South America and I went down there as a graduate student in anthropology. And that was kind of an excuse to go live in Peru actually. And I studied there at the, the, the Catholic University uh, graduate studies. And then part of that was to, a uh, component was to work, do field work. And I did that in the Amazon because I was always interested in the Amazon. So it was a bit of wanderlust, anthropology, biology, all kinds of interests coincided there and took me down to Peru. Now I was supposed to stay That's for a year and I stayed for yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. You know, that was kind of my plan, too. I, I came here to study abroad as an undergraduate, and then I ended up moving back after I finished my studies, and I've been here ever since. So it's, it's a marvelous country, and it definitely brings you in. <laughs> well, wonderful. Before I pass the mic over to you, I just want to remind the audience that they can submit questions for you anytime during the presentation, either through the Facebook comment section or the Zoom Q&A feature. Well, without further ado, off to you, Kim. Thanks so much. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you for that. And thanks to uh, Inca Expert Travel and Proof for Less for having me here. I'm delighted to be here. And um, normally at this point, if I had an audience I could see, I would say I would ask how many of you have actually been to Peru. So I'm assuming that some of you have and some of you haven't. If you haven't been, <clears throat> I highly recommend it. It's like top travel destination in the world. And we're going to learn some of the reasons why in a bit. And if you've already been, then probably like me, you're, you can't wait to go back as soon as conditions become more normal. So without further ado, I'm going to share my screen here and I have a little presentation to share with you. And um, there we go. Whoops, I jumped up a little bit, one second. Darn it. Having a little trouble here. One second. I want to start right here. My bad. Okay. All right. So, yeah, we're going to talk a little bit. Oh, I don't know why it keeps doing that. Sorry. For some reason, it keeps jumping back to that slide. Let me try that one more time. Uh, since. There we go. Okay. So, Land of the Incas. We talk a little bit about uh, obviously Peru, Western South America and some of the reasons why it's so fabulous. And, and it's kind of the prelude to, it's a two-part uh, talk. I'm gonna be talking next weekend as well. And that's on the conquest of the Incas, but this is kind of like the backstory to that. You know, everybody's all heard about the Incas, but what happened before the Incas? You know, who, who came before them and, and how did they create the largest Native American empire in the new world? And Kieran kind of preempted this, but how I got interested in Incas, I already mentioned that. I went down as a, as a graduate student in anthropology. Um, I had an 
idea that Peru would be a fascinating place to go because it has so many different cultures, and history and that kind of thing. So I headed down there and went to university there then and did field work out in the Amazon jungle. And if you can see this map right here, there's Lima. 60% <clears throat> of Peru is, well, here the coast is all dry desert. Then there's the Andes Mountains, many of the peaks of which are over 20,000 feet. And then 60% of Peru is the Amazon jungle. And, it, and it's not just the Amazon jungle, it's the upper, upper, upper Amazon jungle because the Amazon is 3,000 miles to the east, the mouth of the Amazon. And by the time you get up into these, um, into the furthest reaches of the Amazon, that was the least explored parts of the Amazon. And probably the least explored of all those areas was this southeastern region of Peru here, which for a variety of reasons, there was um, um, cataracts and, and rapids here that nobody could pass up on boat to this from Bolivia up into this region right here, which is the Madre de Dios region. And if you came up this way, there's actually a Divortium Aquarium where you couldn't, the mountains separated the two watersheds. All the rivers here go north and out east and all the rivers on this side of that watershed go out this way. So I went out here to an area called uh, Minor National Park. You can see there's Machu Picchu, uh, there's Cusco. So if you go down from those elevations, Cusco is like 11,500 feet and go down to a couple thousand feet, you're down in the lowland rainforest. And Manu Biosphere Reserve is one of the largest biosphere reserves in the world, rainforest reserves. And, and one of the things they had going for it, there was an uncontacted tribe inside called the Machu Picchu. And there's a whole lot of tribes in this area that are uh, very remote. And I had heard that there was a tribe that just been recently contacted called the Yora or Yaminawa up in this area up here. So I headed out there to, nobody really knew much about them to find out more about them. And they were slash and burn agriculturalists. They, they lived in um, the upper watershed of the Minor National Park, as I said, up in an area called the Fitzcarraldo Pass, which was the dividing line between those two big watersheds. And they pretty much kept everybody out from going in there um, with their bows and arrows and that kind of thing. And they were finally contacted in the mid 1980s by Shell Oil Explorers. And, and uh, that's how they actually made their first contact. And this is up, um, uh, this is one of their, they live in very small villages. It's a, there's a village in the back, in the, uh, one of the houses in the back, they'd sleep in hammocks. This is the Yaminama woman with her uh, child about two years after contact. And I stay with them for about six months. And the interesting thing is they had all kinds of stories. And one of the stories they told me a number of times was um, that way back in the day, I mean, their ancestors used to trade with the people that lived high up in the mountains. That were, and it was very cold and they wore long clothes. They wore clothing. And they were referring to the Incas, the Inca empire because the Incas used to go down the Amazon and trade for goods. In fact, when I was living in the village, um, that one, of the, one of the families there had actually a, a, a uh, bronze Inca axe head that probably circulated in the Amazon for 500 years. So they, they remembered their contacts with the Incas. And that was kind of the first thing I started to hear about them. And they're very, very curious people. Um, and they had often asked me questions. And so one time I was sitting around with some of the men and, and they were starting to, they realized I was not from anywhere nearby. And he said, well, so, um, so they were interested in what kind of land I lived in. What was the land like that I came from? And so they said, uh, so what kind of cats do you have? Do you have like jaguars that, you know, like we have? And I said, no, no, we don't have any cats at all. And they're really kind of surprised to hear that. No cats, no jaguars. That's how weird is that? And then they said, well, how about your taper? What kind of taper do you have? Are your tapers as big as ours? And I said, well, and I'm from Las Vegas, Nevada, by the way, Mojave Desert. So I said, no, we don't have any taper, um, no taper at all you know, zero taper, like, oh my gosh, you know, how, how, what a strange place that must be. And they said, well, what about your monkeys? How many monkeys, you know, what kind of monkeys do you have? Do you have like the, you know, in, in this area of, of Peru, they have like 13 species of monkeys. And so I had to tell them that, no, we don't, we don't have any monkeys at all, actually, you know, zero monkeys. I said, in fact, we don't even have any trees where I live. Um, um, I mean, we have bushes about, we have bushes about this high and we have a lot of snakes and lizards. And they kind of looked at each other and they thought about that. And finally one said to the other, so that's why you've come here, right? And, and it was kind of funny at the time, but you know, it's really true that if you think about travel, I mean, the reason everybody, the reason people travel, unless it's for business is primarily vacation travel is you want to go visit places that don't have things like where you're from. If everything in the world was the same, then nobody would bother to travel except maybe for business. So, um, Anyhow, they were not impressed by the description of the Mojave Desert, I can tell you. Um, 
anyhow, after that, I got into documentary films, became a documentary filmmaker, um, made a lot of, actually went down to Peru and made a bunch of films on that area. Uh, Mine National Park for like PBS. I did a, a one on the, that same area for Discovery Channel, a couple for Discovery Channels on one of the Machiganga Indians out there. And then made films like Grizzly Bears and Siberia and Papua New Guinea and pretty much around the world uh, as a documentary filmmaker. Um, and then also, I, you know, I read a bunch of books, as Kiernan said, and all of them based in Peru or Western South America. Um, did one on Modern National Park, it was the first one because I lived out there with the Yaminawa. And then another one on the uh, uh, Boaja Soneni National Park, which is down in southeastern Peru as well, and, and Madidi National Parks, they kind of straddle each other. One on the Camelids, which are so important for the Andes. Um, my most recent was Life and Death in the Andes, which is about a trip from Colombia all the way down to Tierra del Fuego, down in the south, 4,000 miles. And the one that this uh, talk and the next one are based upon the last days of the Incas, which is about how did 168 conquistadors conquer an empire of 10 million? How did they do that? So I'm kind of basing a lot of this on, on that book, Last Days of the Incas. And so um, what I like to say is that, you know, everybody's heard about the Incas because they're the most famous tribe of all tribes from, from the New World. And, um, but uh, even talk about them and understand, it, you know, where they came from and how they did what they, they did and how they left all this fantastic, you know, architectural remains and, and whatnot. It's, it's good to know something about Peru that, that gave birth to them, or at least, you know, Western South America. So as I mentioned, you know, South American coast, for those who've been down there, it's, it's a bone dry desert. Uh, there's the Humboldt Current, which comes up from, from the south from the Antarctic, and it's so cold that water does, does not evaporate into the air, and, and there's no rainfall, basically, so it's kind of like the Sahara Desert. Then there's the Andes, the, the western side of which are pretty dry, and then you go down the eastern Andes, you run into the cloud forest, and you run into the Amazon jungle, and all the moisture from, from there comes from the east, from the trade winds that blow in from the Atlantic. Uh, ocean. So it's a very diverse and very stark and extreme group of environments that comprise the country of Peru. Um, and some fast facts, um, populations about 32 million. Uh, Lima, the capital, has about 10 million people, pretty big city. The official languages are Spanish, Quechua, Quechua and Aymara, and Quechua is the language that the Incas spoke, so there's still a lot of those speakers around. Aymara is one of the one of the many kingdoms that were that Incas conquered, but their southern kingdom in Peru, Bolivia. And so there's a lot of Aymara speakers, and many other languages are spoken in Peru, but these are the official languages. Number of Quechua speakers about eight million, so that's quite a few. Again, that that's the language that the Incas spoke, and they spread their their language across the Andes and across their empire. They're actually before COVID hit, they were uh, Peru has done pretty well in the last last couple, you know, couple decades, they've, you know, they come from poverty to being ranked as upper middle income. So economically, they've had a resurgence in the last, fortunately, in the last uh, couple decades. Uh, the largest industries are fishing, mining, and, and the third largest one is tourism. And that's because it's such a magnet for, you know, such a, such a great place to visit. So that's a really big industry there. Major trading partners, the United States, China, Brazil, the European Union, and Chile. And the current president, um, Martin Vizcarra, which he's been there since 2018. And among the many superlatives in Peru and the, in the Western Andes are, you know, the enormous amount of biodiversity. And that's resulted into, give or take, a thousand or so, 4,000 varieties of potatoes. Potatoes were uh, originally um, created, or I should say, the agriculturists created uh, various varieties of potatoes up in the, in the Andes. And if you think about going to a normal grocery store, you might find one or two or three varieties. Well, in Peru, they have like 4,000. So that's where they, they were actually uh, uh, created on the Andes. Same thing with um, corn. That corn actually originated in, was domesticated in Southern Mexico, but over thousands of years, it spread throughout the Americas, including South America. And in Peru, there's 55 different varieties of corn. Again, you think of the corn that we eat at grocery stores, like one variety. Uh, there's just huge biodiversity down there. Um, huge biodiversity in fish species. Peru's number one in the world in number of fish, fish species, and that's the freshwater fish species. More than 2,000, because they have the upper Amazon that comes in and all kinds of lakes and whatnot. This is a paiche fish, one of the largest freshwater fish in the world. And it grows up to 10 feet over 200 pounds. Um, enormous Amazonian fish. 
Um, depending on who you speak to, if you speak to a Colombian or a Peruvian, um, they're either Peruvian or number one or number two in bird species, but both Colombia and Peru vie for that uh, record. Um, almost 2,000 bird species, which again, just shows the huge biodiversity. This is a cock of the rock. This, this particular bird lives in the cloud forest of Peru. Number three in amphibians, 323 species of amphibians, huge biodiversity there. Number three in mammals, 460 different species of mammals. And they're still discovering mammals all the time, especially in the Amazon, new mammal species. And just to get an idea of, um, of the size of Peru geographically compared to a country like the United States, you can see that all that biodiversity is kind of squished into a country that's really a fraction of the size of the United States, but has much greater biodiversity than the entire United States, in fact, all of North America. So um, conservation-wise, Peru is called one of the hotspot countries for biodiversity. There's certain countries in the world, certain areas of the world that have huge biodiversity. Peru is one of them. And again, just to show geographically, there's the United States superimposed on South America. You can see the Amazon rainforest is almost as large as the entire continental United States. It's a huge area. And there's not only great biodiversity, there's great cultural diversity um, because you've had people living in Peru for many thousands of years. And these are some um, uh, villagers from the uh, town of Chinchero, which is outside of Cusco. It's one of the weaving capitals of South America. And, uh, and these are, these are native Quechua speakers. So they speak the language, the Incas as their native language and, and Spanish as their second language. They're bi bilingual. Um, and here's like a map of the, some of the Quechua speakers. You know, the Inca empire originated out in the area of Cusco. So not surprisingly, the highest concentration of, of, of Quechua speakers which came from the Inca empire are still down in Southern Peru, but there's 8 million of them still. And also there's like there's huge biodiversity, there's huge cultural diversity in other areas as well, especially the Amazon jungle. You know, back when Europeans came, there was probably a hundred or more languages in the Amazonian jungle and represented by that many tribes. And these are different parks and reserves for recently contacted people or uncontacted people. This is Southeastern Peru. So this is um, um, the area I live. This is Minor National Park. They made a reserve for the people that I worked with and another group called the Cogalpa uh, Cordi, which are the Machigangas in this area here. And there's the uh, Machigopito Mach Territory Reserve. This is an uncont well, tribe actually coming into contact right now in the Manu area in this area right, right here. So there's still probably 20 to 50 different uh, uncontacted tribes in this area of Brazil and uh, Eastern Peru, still very remote areas to this day. And this is just a photo of the, one of the a uh, woman in a tribe that I, I lived with, and this is not long after their contact. And it's kind of an interesting photo. This is, um, uh, in their culture, she's really decked out. She has achiote paste up here in her hair. It's kind of a red uh, paste they get from a, a fruit that lives out in the Amazon. These massive bead necklaces there. She's got some kind of, I think, uh, probably a monkey tooth uh, necklace here. And these are bead necklaces. They make their, made their own cotton clothes. You know, they grew cotton and, and wove it. Um, she's got all these tattoos. And the funny thing is, and she's holding uh, uh, an eagle foot there. And these are the equivalent of perfume. These are flowers that are tied to her arms and they're very, you know, uh, like, like our perfume. So um, I don't know why she was all decked out like that, but this is uh, one of the recently contacted people down in Peru, the, the Yoda. So I'm at, often asked um, pretty frequently, um, did the Incas really be, build these, these um, you know, build these structures and stuff, you know. In fact, I was even contacted once by a, a, a television channel. I said, hey, can we interview you for a, a show? And, and they wouldn't tell me what the show was. I said, well, you know, it sounds interesting. And it took me about three or four conversations before I realized, before they told me, it was like, I forget the name of the show, something about aliens and UFOs and that kind of thing. I said, well, that's all right. Um, I'll pass on that. But I'm asked that all the time. And it's understandable why uh, people might think that. How could human beings, especially human beings like 500 years ago, create these kind of colossal monumental structures, right? And you can kind of see the scale there of the people there and the stones, which you actually see better here. How could humans actually move this stuff around? How could humans ever have cut these things, and fit them in so perfectly and move these massive, you know, multi-ton things? I mean, you could see why somebody else must have done it, right? Aliens must have come down, that kind of thing. And one of the things I hope to convey here is that, um, um, some of the reasons why, where the Incas got this knowledge from, but they've left, left these monuments that 500 years after the contact um, 
are still standing tall. And it's interesting, like this is a street in Cusco that um, they, the Andes is very earthquake prone because they're part of the ring of fire. There's a lot of geological activity. And every time there's been an earthquake over the last 500 years, the Spaniards always like to build on top of the Inca structures. This is all in colonial Spanish. And here's the Inca, one of the original Inca walls. And the difference is the Spaniards and Europeans use mortar. They would put bricks and that kind of thing and put mortar and the Incas did not. So when an earthquake would come, these stones can, they can jostle around. They can, they can flex, they can move. And they're still there after 500 years. And usually the earthquake, the first thing that comes down are all the Spanish buildings and, this, and then they rebuild them. But they were not only made kind of monumental structures, but they are very cleverly engineered in terms of their environment. And they had different styles. It almost looks like a, um, you know, perspective painting or something like that. But this is one of the styles. We have all the stones laid out, but they're still there. And of course, um, those who've already been down there or those who haven't, I'm sure you've heard of Machu Picchu. The Incas were also famous for um, not only building the largest um, New World Empire, but also for building spectacular, and Machu Picchu is one of these spectacular citadels in some really remote areas, beautiful locations. But how did that all start? This is gonna be a real quick tour of history just to see where this all got started. Um, you know, we evolved in Africa and 300,000 years ago, and it took us a couple hundred thousand years hanging out in Africa before the first Homo sapiens started heading up into Europe and the Middle East and that kind of thing and made this gradual progression over in this direction. You know, humans actually arrived in Australia, surprisingly enough, 50, 60,000 years ago, which has always been separated by water. So you figure that, you must have had some kind of boats 50, 60,000 years ago or some way to hang on to something across the water. And then they crossed the Bering Strait and it's still being explored, but first humans crossed the Bering Strait anywhere from 15 to 20,000 years ago, somewhere there when theoretically when the, it was covered by ice. So this was not, a, this was not uh, separated by water, but you could walk over the ice. There's also a dotted line. One of the theories that people may have come down you know, independently or, or in, in, uh, on foot, but also by water. They may have had things like kayaks and things like that. So one theory is that people traveled down the coast all the way into South America. And they got to South America, depending on what the arche you know, archeological dating says, anywhere from 12,000 to 20,000 or so years ago. So this was the last, these were, the North America was the last place to be colonized by the, the original Homo sapiens that came out of Africa. And this is just a depiction of what the Bering Strait looked. I actually made some films up in the Bering, Bering Strait area, but um, that when that was covered by the last ice age, that was all glaciated. So you could, could have walked over land. And, and the theory is that people followed uh, the big mammals down into North America and eventually South America. And the people that came, they already had culture with them because they'd already been around for almost 300,000 years. So they had stone tools bows and arrows, you know, they had um, languages, they had, uh, and they were, they were um, expert hunter gatherers, no agriculture, but they knew how to hunt animals and gather wildlife and they knew their environment. So that's who first headed into the new world. And the world they walked into uh, 15, 20,000 years ago was very different from the one now. They had, they encountered giant sloths, which um, um, are now extinct, um, giant armadillos, they hunt, they hunted these. And also um, in North America and Central America, woolly mammoths, that kind of thing. There's an ancient rhinoceros, that kind of thing. So they, they were in a completely different world from the one that we are today. And, and these animals all kind of went extinct, coinciding with the change in the last ice age, but also with the arrival of humans who presumably helped push them into extinction by hunting them. And this is a, a real quick overview history I kind of like, I found someplace, but uh, basically it sums up cultural history and um, it says here, starting, it says 200,000 years ago, but actually it's 300,000 years ago now. This is what happened. Nothing, 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 nothing. Man plays with stone tools, makes cave art, and suddenly discovers agriculture way over here, right? That's a little bit of exaggeration, but we used stone tools for 300,000 years and didn't stumble across agriculture until roughly 10,000 years ago. And when people first learned that they could put seeds in the ground and, and, and food plants would come out, that just, funnily enough, after 290,000 years, it took 290,000 years to figure it out, that revolutionized uh, human societies. And this is a, a graph of the human population. Here's like the, the beginning of the agricultural revolution. We just discovered how to grow plants and populations started to shoot up. And then here now it's going straight up as a consequence. 
And agriculture um, it grew up in six or seven different places around the world um, and then spread from there. And, and one of them, three of them were in the Americas, one in this area of, you know, in North America, down in the, what's now known as Mexico, and also in the Andes and in the Amazon was one of the original places that, that early peoples discovered the art of agriculture. And uh, not surprisingly, these areas house some of the first civilizations. Here eventually came the Mayas, Aztecs, the Incas, the Egyptians, Mesopotamia, you know, Babylonians, et cetera, et cetera, and the Chinese, uh, many of the Chinese empires. So that was totally related to the discovery of agriculture. So going back to Peru, um, as I said, that the, the coast area is bone dry desert, just like in the Sahara, and there's the Andes, and there's the Amazon. And the, the thing about the desert, it's kind of like the Nile River in Egypt. Um, and you know, the, everybody knows the Nile River in Egypt, you know, floods, that kind of thing. And that provides water in a desert area. And around that river, civilization arose because people figured out how to use the water and grow plants. And it's a very similar kind of thing happened in the bone dry desert of the Peruvian coast, which is all sand except it's bisected by these little rivers coming out of the Andes. And in every one of those little river valleys, people started to settle once they discovered agriculture and they started to form little towns and little city states and that kind of thing. And these are just some of the names of the rivers and actually a lot of them are the cultures that lived, that arose in these areas on this, on this desert coast. So that was one of the cradles of civilization, not just in Peru, but around the world. And the fact that people could um, learn to grow their own plants meant that the energy that was produced per, per capita, the energy was produced per hectare of land vastly increased. And that meant people could settle for the first time. And that's when um, um, inventions started to happen, et cetera. And, and where this happened around the world, um, uh, similar uh, social structures arose from the invention of agriculture which ultimately you'd have a ruler up top and they would have some kind of council, of, you know, priesthood, because usually there were like theocracies. Then you have a noble class, then you'd have the skilled merchants and artisans, and then everything was based on the peasant class who are the ones that actually went out there in the fields and, and created the surplus that allowed all this infrastructure to arise. Not just in Peru, not, you know, but in Mexico and <clears throat> the Americas and you know, around the world. So some of the remnants of that uh, in Peru are, um, and I have two different kinds of dates for some of these, these slides here. This, this is an area, one of the oldest canals in the Americas, the Zanya River up in the Northern Peru. And again, it's a dry area and uh, people start living in the river valleys and they start figuring out, well, how can we get the water from the rivers into, into fields and, and interconnect them, that kind of thing. So 4,700 BC or this, this, these dates have in parentheses, 6,200 years before the Inca showed up, you had people building canals in northern Peru. So it was a six millennia before the Incas showed up. People were already starting to live in towns and, and uh, having stratified societies and moving water around through canals. Another feature you have in Peru, uh, I think I mentioned is that you have the Humboldt Current coming up from Antarctica. And one of the things that it flows up north and bends around here, but it, it brings up huge um, upwellings of uh, uh, nutrients from, from the Antarctic Arctic region. And that has fueled one of the biggest or most uh, biodiverse uh, fisheries in the world. Um, and a lot of the early cultures <clears throat> started off by living on the coast and actually harvesting fish. In fact, some of the earliest inventions of, um, of agriculture in Peru and on the coast are cotton because they grew cotton before they grew like edible plants because they used the cotton to spin nets to catch the fish. And that's still a massive, you saw on the other chart that that's the number two industry, our number one industry actually fishing in Peru still to this day because of the Humboldt Current. This is a giant manta ray uh, caught somewhere off of Northern Peru, but just a tremendously rich fishery, uh, fisheries. So over time you had little uh, river valleys here on the coast and you have these different cultures and these are some of the names there and they left ruins and we're gonna go look at this one right here. Lima is just elsewhere in the Northern coast right here. There's a place called uh, Banduria up, um, which is right here, Bandaria, which is um, 3,200 years BC, the time of the, of the um, old kingdom pyramids in, Peru, in uh, Egypt. They were, they were building structures made out of millions of adobe bricks on the coast of Peru, 4,700 years before the Incas showed up. And this is a fairly recent discovery as far as the dating. So this is like the oldest town known anywhere in the Americas and one of the oldest in the world, um, or, or structures, I should say. 
and this is what it kind of they had a ceremonial plaza um, um, they had temples that kind of thing and obviously they they must have had a stratified society because they moved millions they've created uh, millions of adobe bricks organized them had engineers figure out how to put them all together you know peasants laborers artisans all that kind of stuff you know four millennia before the incas showed up and there, oh and there's no evidence of warfare at least thus far found any in, in the remains there no. and Elsewhere, there's um, similar things were happening along the northern coast, along these little um, river valleys I was mentioning. And these are sometimes termed the coastal kingdoms in Peru. In fact, they have a tours you can do, which are fascinating, which I've done. You can visit some of these coastal areas and a lot of them have great museums, that kind of thing. And there's literally just these big, big pyramids arising out of the dry desert that were once um, peopled by thousands of uh, people, thousands of years BC. Another place, this is North Lima Caral, which is, uh, was previously known as the oldest town in, in, in the Americas. Not anymore, but still pretty ancient. Um, 2,600 BC, 4,000 years before the Incas. A similar kind of thing, different culture, but they had a similar kind of amphitheater, all kinds of temples, storage rooms, plazas, you know, gathering places, that kind of thing. And I'll get into this later, but something remembers that they had, this is 4,000 years before the Incas, they found quipus, um, which are the new, the the, uh, the cords that lasted for a thousand years in the Andes, which they were kind of like early computers, early accounting machines. They were actually found in the ruins here 4,000 years before the Incas showed up. And again, this far back in history, there's no no uh, archaeological evidence that they were, they were warring at that time, no armies, that kind of thing. Gradually over time, um, you know, one eventually war did come because one little river valley would start to take over the next and so on and so forth. And the first early civilizations arose. This is the Chavin civilization. We're talking about 900 BC or 2400 years before the Incas showed up. They really created one of the first civilizations along the coast of Peru and many widespread cultural contact. And um, they are also, they are based in the Andes and on the coast, but originally from the Andes. These are high altitude farmers and llama herders. So they've domesticated llamas and alpacas. And if, if you haven't, if you have been to Peru, um, well, if you haven't been here, this is up in the middle Northern Andes. It's a fascinating place to visit. It's, um, uh, it's a town called Chavin and they have a temple complex that's kind of the center of their empire. And the way they built this back in the day, they built the, the main temple. It was a pilgrimage site apparently for thousand years or more and people came from all over the Andes to go to this pilgrimage site and within this temple complex they had a, a stele a god inside there and if you go in there is these this is all out of stone you go through with a torch and you wind your way through all this labyrinth and chambers and you finally come to the central chamber there's this huge stele with this god with all kinds of um, anthropomorphic features and also there's like crocodile uh, uh, caimans and stuff imagery from the the jungle there but according to at least one archaeologist, they built this between two rivers and they had uh, one river higher than the other. And the water came in and, and came went through these chambers and resonated with fre a frequency that made it sound like the, a roaring God. So nobody but the priests knew about this. So as you wound with your torch down through these really dark chambers looking, going to meet the God, you would hear this really kind of unearthly roaring sound, which you couldn't figure out where it came from. And I call that I am the great and powerful Oz from Wizard of Oz, if you remember. And this is a uh, picture of the stele there. Um, you can kind of see like a priest, there's a arms, that kind of thing, and all kinds of interesting um, uh, figurines and a lot of Amazonian motifs, which leads one to believe that way back then that they were having contact with the Amazon jungle and the tribes that were out there, the cultures. And now warfare does rear its head. This is like 2,400 years, 2,400 years before the Incas, but this is from the Chavin culture. Here's a warrior right here. He's holding a severed, severed head. You see the eyes and the mouth and that kind of thing. So now that uh, civilization is getting more complex and like, and presumably because land is becoming scarce as good agricultural land, people start to fight each other over it. And now this, if you go further, we're just going to jump further further in, into uh, into the future, this is 500 AD, 2000 years before the Incas arrived. had you visited the, the area of what is now Peru, you would have found a variety of cultures down uh, Lake Titicaca region. There's a Tiwanaku kingdom um, up here, which is about 11, 12,000 feet up in the Andes. There's some cultures here you may have heard of, Nazca culture, which are famous for the lines that are etched on the desert floor. You can only see from planes and balloons and that kind of thing. 
the Moche culture, another culture up here. So you have different kingdoms starting to arise um, over time that are all agriculturally based. And had you visited there and with a drone or a little helicopter and flown around, you would have seen things like this and scattered along the Peruvian coast. And you can kind of see the, the enormity of the scale. These are people down here. You know, you're talking about millions and millions. These are adobe bricks, but millions and millions and millions of bricks, so which could only be done if you had a really hierarchical, you know, stratified society that was, you had people directing things, and engineers and artisans and peasants tilling all the stuff and agricultural canals. You know, they basically made all of these, these dry valleys green by, by using aqueducts and things and, and figuring out how to put water, bring water out there and to spread agriculture. Here's another one kind of a scale model with a different one, but these, these littered the coast, including in Lima. The town of Lima had the same kind of thing going on. There's still pyramids you can visit right smack dab in the, in the city of Lima today. Jumping down the Lake Titicaca area, this is 300 BC, uh, 300 AD, um, which is about 1,000 thousand years, 1,100 years before the Incas arose. You had the Tiwanaku culture, which is 11,000, 12,000 12, feet up in the Andes, and you had stone, a whole assemblage of stone pyramids, I think there's like 16 stone pyramids out there. And this was a huge um, ceremonial center and a huge pilgrimage area. And these are people bringing peasants and visitors from around the Andes, around, you know, traveling sometimes thousands of miles to come. This is the Mecca of the day back then, uh, 300 BC, around the time of Christ, and uh, to visit. And it's, it's a beautiful area. It's right on the right near the Lake Titicaca, which is a beautiful lake. And this culture was cutting stone. This is one of their stone walls still extends. It's 2,000 years old. It's like a Roman, same time as the Romans. And these are giant uh, stones that are they've dragged up here and cut and put in between there. Uh, but the fascinating thing is that if you wander around here, um, you can realize that wow, a thousand years before the Incas, they were cutting stone, you know, just as just as well and moving things around, and they had architects and whatnot, you know, way back then. And already, as you can see, this culture arose on the remnants of five thousand years of previous cultures. So there's layer after layer after layer of cultures in Peru, and this is one of the um, one of the Tiwanaku. This is uh, uh, the Sun Gate. Um, and this is a big monolith. This is one piece of stone, which is cracked here. It weighed 27 tons, and it wasn't from around here. It was from a quarry somewhere on Lake Titicaca, off of Lake Titicaca. And so somehow they cut this 27-ton stele. You know, they think they may have put it on reed boats and moved it that way, but who knows? But they were able to move this over and bring this to their temple complex at Tiwanaku, their capital. Then uh, moving forward in history, 100, 700 AD, so we've jumped forward um, about 500 years. This is 700 years before the Incas um, were around. This is up in Northern Peru, it's called the Moche culture. Um, way up here, if you see Peru right here, there's the Northern Peru. And, and some of you may have heard of this because back in the eighties, they, they made a series of discoveries. And uh, one of the most famous, which is likened to uh, King Tut was the Lord of Sipan. And this is a series of burials um, in, in, the, in the same kind of uh, hydraulic cultures there, but this is a, a burial of obviously a very powerful Lord. And there's the Lord down here with a skeleton and gold, um, you know, gold face mask and all kinds of different kinds of bronze and whatnot and ornaments and that kind of thing, buried with things that presumably were meant for the afterlife and all these pots, buried with um, guards that had their feet severed so they couldn't run off apparently. Uh, various and um, this was a very lavish ceremony for a very high-ranking lord of this empire back then. And this is what, uh, with all that stuff reassembled, uh, the burial would have looked like. This is what the 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 lord of Sipan would have looked like back in the day. And you can imagine encountering this person as a peasant walking down the street, right? If you're probably not even allowed to, but you know, obviously by now humans had stratified in such a way that it was very clear what their rank was, where they, what position they occupied on the, the pyramid of power. And also more than likely, this would have been a godlike figure, you know, theocratic individual. And these are, this is real gold. These are scattered museums, so there's a museum down there in, the, in that area called the Sipan Museum, which is great. And these golden masks are there, but uh, pretty, pretty impressive, pretty amazing. Uh, another view of, um, uh, some of the gold ornaments, that kind of thing. These are turquoise and gold from that culture. 
And again, it just harkens back to this obvious stratification that occurred once agriculture was discovered and uh, obviously in Peru, they really took advantage of that to create very complex societies that allowed them to come up with the inventions necessary to be able to establish you know, uh, populations in areas that previously they had not been able to. People without that technology were not able to live on those dry, bone dry deserts only in very limited numbers. But now with all their inventions and stratification and, and organization, now suddenly populations were expanding, they're harvesting, uh, cultivating areas that have never been cultivated before. And that was all because of the, um, the complexity of, of civilization. But part and parcel of that is the, the arrival of uh, uh, armies, professional armies. This is a figure from the Moche culture. This is a, a soldier who's got a helmet, protect himself, um, a shield on the arm and some kind of, you know, a stone mace to, to, to go to war. So now you have different societies and they're warring against each other, presumably over the lack of resources. But um, that was a very quick archeological tour through Peru. Uh, some of the 6,000 years of history there and I was thinking, you know, all archaeologists um, would say that Peru is an archaeological wonderland. And I've talked to various archaeologists, and, and, and probably like to, to this day, maybe 1% of Peru has been examined archaeologically. Um, it's just, you know, it's an open air museum, and they're making discoveries every day, and they've only scratched the surface of what's under the sands, many times really well preserved. So if you had in, um, visited Peru in 1400 AD, we're jumping to getting to the European contact, 51 years before Columbus was born, had you got in a ship and traveled over there, um, this is what you would have seen. This is the makeup of Peru 1400 years AD. And just as we've seen all those little cultures that you know, come and gone and, and different kingdoms had arisen and some had expanded and conquered others and that kind of thing. So in 1400 AD, this, you would have found the Chimor kingdom up here, the, You've heard of Chimu, the Chimu culture. They had expanded all across the coast here, all the way from Northern Peru, all the way down to Southern Peru. You know, the Aymara kingdom, that's one of the extant languages that, that we mentioned earlier, one of the official languages. This is the, the kingdom of the Aymaras up in the highlands of uh, the Andes and Bolivia and, and Peru and what's part of Chile right now. The, uh, the Nazca culture, the ones with the famous lines that you can only see from plains. There's a culture here called the Huanca culture, um, Cusco culture, which is really the origin of the Incas. That's just Incas at this time were just this little, little area right here, nothing more than a small kingdom, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These are the kingdoms that were there at the time. Of course, in the Amazon jungle at the time, there would have been zillions of tribes and tons of languages and all kinds of things going on. And so the Chima culture um, is, just prior to the Inca culture, but this is an example of what that looked like up in Northern Peru. Again, a hydraulic society, very organized, uh, high densities of people, that kind of thing. And um, this is um, uh, their capital here. And this is the layout of their, their main capital there um, with all they had. Um, I was just there uh, about a year ago again. I hadn't been there in quite a while. And they have this kind of reflective pool built right. This is on the desert. They have this big reflective pool. And they think that's what astronomers used like as a mirror during the night to look and make astronomical observations. This is um, textile areas and here's the kitchens and ceremonial centers and all kinds of stuff like that. So Chan Chan is the name, it's the, the capital um, of the ancient Chimo empire. And where all this was going on, this is like a uh, X-ray of the Andes or of Peru is that you have the Pacific ocean with the Humboldt current coming up the coast you have the very bone dry desert with those rivers that I talked about coming down there where civilizations were, were rising from. Then you have the Andes mountains and in many of the Andes mountains, you have valleys. And in some of those valleys, that's where early agriculture got started, including the, the Incas. And this is Quechua speaking. So this is like 11,000 feet up in, in the Andes. So you have people settling in those kind of warmer uh, fertile valleys. And then down the eastern coast, eastern edge of the Andes, you go down through the, the rainforest, down into the lowland Amazon jungle, and all the tribes down there. That's like a cross section of what that western uh, Peru, South America looks like. And in these valleys that are in between, up in the Andes, they're alluded to that they were rich. They often had rivers coming down from the glaciers, that kind of thing. So they had rich agricultural land, and that's where various tribes settled, including uh, the Inca culture and warred over trying to, because that was, um, there was a limited amount of that kind of culture. And in Inca mythology, you know, um, the Incas, when the Spaniards got there, they took down their stories and wrote down, you know, as much as they, they 
they were interested back in the time, but in the Inca mythology, they said, well, when they were asked, where did you come from? Where are the Incas? How did the Incas arrive here? They said, well, way back in the day, Lake Titicaca, there was some, someone named Manco Capac and Cura Oclo, and they were the originators of the Inca empire. They rose out of the water of Lake Titicaca, and he had a golden staff, and they started walking north. And their idea was that when they could take the staff and plunge it, and it would go into the ground and find rich soil, they would establish civilization. And that's what they did here. Um, um, it's plunging the staff there. And this is in the Valley of Cusco. And they found rich agricultural soil and they established their civilization. And just to give you an orientation, here we are in Lima. This is the Andes Mountains, all the way up, all the way to Colombia, all the way down to Cerro Fuego. And then here's all the, the Amazon jungle. Quito is the biggest city up north. There's Machu Picchu and Cusco, and then Lake Titicaca out there. And so the Incas started in this fertile valley in the Cusco area. And, um, and as I mentioned before, if you went there in 1400 AD, this is about as the, the size of the extent of it. But what happened, at least according to um, what Inca oral story said, is that they were challenged by the Huanca um, Empire, smaller, small kingdom actually. The Huancas wanted to expand their area and they wanted to take over the Cusco Valley. So they were larger and more powerful than the Incas, which is a very small kingdom. And so the, the leader of the Incas fled. He was, he was an old man. He fled and he's left his son in charge. And his son decided to face the Huanca. And the son, um, I can, I'm just giving you the outcome of, the, of the, the battle there, but the son raised an army, fought the Huanca, conquered the Huanca, and renamed himself Pachacutec. And he is now known as kind of the Alexander the Great of the Inca Empire. So he conquered, he just headed off the danger from the Huanca uh, kingdom, um, saved the empire and started the ascension or the growth of, of the Incas into an actual empire. And this is him being carried in a litter. All the nobles back in Inca times, the rulers were carried on litters. Um, this is them uh, going to a nearby um, uh, tribe, they started their own uh, conquest. And I think they probably realized that if we stay a small kingdom, then we're gonna be vulnerable to any other larger kingdom like the, the Wankas. So why don't we start to expand and, and enlarge our kingdom? And this is kind of like a historical chart of the Inca empire. And these are the various emperors going back to Pachacuti. This is the, this is the Alexander the Great, roughly 1438 um, AD to 1463. He conquered this area, starting in Cusco here. He conquered his area during his lifetime there. His son Tupac Inca conquered up into the north. His son, um, uh, also Tupac Inca, conquered this area here. Then uh, Huayna Capac conquered his whole area in the south. And one by one, each emperor started enlarging the, the Inca empire until in, until in a very, roughly a hundred year period, it became the largest empire that ever existed in the new world. About 3,000, 2,500, 3,000 miles in length and over a topography that was enormously complex. And the way they went about it, um, I call it, they would go to a nearby uh, uh, kingdom or tribe and they would make them an offer they couldn't refuse. And the offer was basically a very simple one. It said, if you allow us to uh, take over your land, we will allow you to have your local rulers. We will allow you to keep your local gods. All we ask in return is that we administer and that your taxes, your the taxes, meaning taxes paid in produce, a portion of that go to, go to us. Um, if you agree to that, then we're cool, right? Everybody's gonna live. If you don't agree to that, that was the flip side of the offer, we will come in and we will wipe you out. We will literally remove you from the landscape. And the Incas would arrive and they'd have 100,000. I mean, they were, they were great administrators and great organizers. So they would arrive in a valley and they would arrive like with 100,000 warriors or 200,000 warriors. So you can imagine being a small kingdom and looking up there on the horizon, you got 100,000, 200,000 well-organized um, soldiers up there and this offer. And so most, most people went for it. So the empire that they conquered, um, they called Tawantin Suyu, which um, translated as means the land of the four quarters because they actually split the administration of their empire up into what kind of four quadrants. And one was Chincha Suyo, which is this green part up here, all the way up in Ecuador. Um, then they had uh, Ante Suyo, which is out here in the jungle portion, Kunti Suyo down in the south, and so on and so forth. And these all intersected um, the four different quadrants in the capital of the Inca Empire, which is where they started in the uh, Cusco, 
their capital. Um, and I think, you know, without being stated that, whoops, sorry, I just went the wrong way there. Um, the Incas realized that the larger the peasant base, the greater the power, because if most of these, these, these uh, uh, cultures back then, the civilizations, they were based on peasant power, meaning that the peasants produced the only, produced the surplus, not just in, in grains, but in weavings and that kind of thing. They produced more than they needed to survive. And so the excess was taxed. And so the more peasants that you controlled, um, the, the larger the surplus, the larger the income. And the more the larger the income, that meant the more merchants and artisans and royal family and all that kind of stuff. So the more peasants you conquered um, and controlled, the more powerful your empire became, not to mention you know, creating a warrior class and that kind of thing and having to feed them. But what the Incas would do if they conquered an area, they would go in there and they, the first thing they do is they'd send their uh, like accountants, their, their inventory people, and they would go in there and they would, they would literally count all the different resources, the streams, the fields, they'd measure the fields, the number of people, the sexes of the people, mining, fisheries, whatever. They would keep records of it and they would take that back to Cusco and they'd make their decisions about how they would administer that area. And what they inevitably, be, inevitably did, where they would build their own administrative centers in, in a conquered territory. And they all kind of look the same. They have these, these square areas that are called canchas um, and they would have a house, the, these rooms inside they're entered there. And if anybody's been to the town of Ollante Tambo, there's still an extant uh, Inca administrative um, center there that people still live in. And you can, it literally looks kind of like this with a more modern roofs, but they would put their administrative center there and they'd send their administrators who would live in these provinces and help administer them. And to store all the information is because they've started from a ver one valley and extended it 2,500, 3,000 miles in length with different cultures, different languages, different topographies, different resources. The only way they could actually make it work um, was they use kipus, which I'd mentioned before was actually found that they started using kipus 4,000 years before the Incas, but the kipus are these knotted cores. These are information storage device and unique to the, to the uh, Western South America. And they've never, they have not deciphered how they were actually used, but the early Spaniards said they could store all kinds of information, stories, you know, all kinds of um, information, histories, that kind of thing. But what they have deciphered is the, is the numeric uh, fashion, how they stored numbers. And this is an example. They had this, this first line here is the hundreds, just like we have their decimals. This section here is, is tens, this section here is one. So in this particular thread, whatever it represented at the time, there's a single knot in the hundred section that meant a hundred. There's three knots in the in the tens section that meant 30. And there's a double knot in the one section that's two. And you add them up 132 and get your number. And this is four knots, it's 400 and one knot and seven knots, 417. And you could add them this way as well. One and four is is a five, and this is the summation of this column right here. Whoops, sorry about that. So you can, they're summed up here. So pretty fascinating system, much of which the information of which of how it was used, we've lost and, they, and some of them are color coded, but they're still working on trying to figure out how to decipher them. And they, they keep making discoveries and looking through old chronicles and that kind of thing. And the people that could read them um, were called Kipu Kamayuks, which are the keepers of the Kipus. And this is an illustration. Of, of one of them, here's a big keeper court. So they would send these people around the provinces and they would collect all the information and take it back. And that's how it was all tabulated. And I have this, which, um, it's just the thing to say, once things became stratified, this is just some random, these are just some of the professions that existed in the Inca empire. And, and, and the same was true of all those previous empires I've, I showed you that, you know, by this time of this level of civilization, you had miners and metallurgists and astronomers and historians and kipu readers and consultants, um, oracles, teachers, diplomats, administrators, weavers, shipbuilders, tax collectors, laborers, stone cutters, map makers, on and on and on. It was very complicated um, and layered society. To make it work um, physically, um, they had to have some way of communication. So they had the kipus to store the information, but the Incas enlarged uh, previous road works and they became masters of road building in, 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 in the Americas. They, they made over 26,000 miles of roads so that they could efficiently move goods and armies and that kind of thing. There's no other way to do it unless you had roads. And, and uh, you can still visit, a lot of these are still extant. And there's one that ran down the coast and there was one that ran down the Andes, kind of like a ladder. And there's these cross, these cross rungs between the two. Um, 
And uh, it was, it's a, that's when you hike the Inca Trail, it's just kind of interesting for those of you that have done it or are thinking about doing it. The Inca Trail is just a, a tiny, 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 tiny little bit of this 26,000 mile network. You know, it's, probably, it's the most famous because it's in great shape and it ends up in Machu Picchu, which is why people walk in. But there's 26,000 miles of these things. It's pretty, pretty, pretty amazing. And the, the means of conveying information um, along those was they had these people called these specialists that were, that were specialists, excuse me, the runners are called Chaskis, which I call the Inca Pony Express. And, <clears throat> excuse me, talking too much. Um, they would have, if you look down here, they built along those road that those 26,000 miles of roads, they built these uh, a tambos, these little these little huts along the way, and they would have a runner waiting to run, and and you'd have one runner running along here, carrying, for example, he's carrying a sack right here, and in the sack is probably a kipu with information, and before they got to the next um, house, um, the next uh, waylay state way station, they would blow on their their uh, trumpet, uh, you know, a big shell, and that that way it would alert the person there. And they would run just like a re relay, running as fast as they could. As soon as they're running alongside, they would pass the pouch on to the next runner, and that runner would run until they got to the next house, and they'd do a relay there. And that's how they could get messages from like 3,000 miles away within within a week or so. Um, that's how they pass messages. They also, from what I've read in different, uh, they've done investigations that they also may have used like a fire signals and that signaling system as well but that's still being investigated but the story is that they could the emperor could dine on fish from from the pacific ocean up in cusco in about a day they'd have chasky runners run fish up there you know to be dined on by the nobles and that kind of thing so that's pretty amazing so getting back to taxation when the ink empire the way they worked it um, a third of the taxes meaning um, would go to the state a third would be for religion and a third be kept by the peasants. So the third would be kept by the peasants to, to survive and, and multiply and that kind of thing. And then two thirds of it would go either for, for either the state or for religion. And the taxes were both in terms of produce or textiles or labor. That's how people were taxed. And it was very well administered with those kipus. So everybody knew what they were supposed to do with certain age groups that were taxed and they would be administered to maybe they would pay their taxes by doing labor in some far up town, like, like Machu Picchu, for example. And then they returned back to their, their, their hometown after the taxes were paid. And one of the things that's um, pretty amazing about them, they sometimes call the Inca socialists, um, but uh, they, they paid a lot of attention for um, sustainability and keeping their population safe because for one reason, just very pragmatically, peasants were the powerhouse of the empire. So they had surpluses of food that were used for taxes and they would put them in these big storehouses. And, and here's some storehouses outside of, um, in the Sacred Valley area, which is on the way to Machu Picchu, it's a town called Ollante Tambo. But they had these staggered throughout the empire. And this is up on the mountainside, so there's good winds there and they'd store grains and all kinds of stuff. In fact, when the early Spaniards, when the first Spanish conquistadors came down there, they kept chronicles and they would, they marveled at seeing these storage places. And they said they were filled to the brim with sandals and clothing and food. And, and whenever something happened, you know, a drought happened or some kind of calamity happened in the area, they were, the, the, local, the local population could draw upon these storehouses, which were provided by the state. And so if they used them up, then they were re replenished from elsewhere in the empire. So they had a whole system of like food reserves and clothing reserves and weapons reserves, and that kind of thing administered throughout the empire. The other thing that the Incas are kind of famous for, uh, they did not invent, but they certainly expanded more than anybody else in the, in, in the Americas. They, they, uh, they expanded agriculture and the way they did it in a very um, topographically difficult and complex region, which means very steep, they made these things, they made terraces, which they call in, in Peru, andenes. And these are specialized platforms that they, they carved out of the mountains and they set up in such a way that if you tried to grow things right up here, the rains would wash it away, that kind of thing. And these were, like, these were planters basically. And they were engineered in such a fashion that you'd have gravel down here for good drainage, some sand. And then this could be a 2000 feet up on the side of a, of a very steep mountain. They would, they would take fertile soil from down the valley and, and haul it all the way up there and fill them in just like you would a planter bed. And they expanded as a consequence the amount, nobody has ever uh, cultivated as much land um, since the Incas in, in South America. You know, even today, they don't cultivate as much land. This allowed them to, to really uh, maximize the agricultural productivity. And these 
uh, terraces or so on. This is on the site of Machu Picchu. It looks very colorful, but these are all the same kind of engineered terraces. And back in the day, they would have grown sacred corn and different kinds of things for the local population here and also for sacrifices. So you see these everywhere in the Andes. And another concept that, another survival technique that the Incas practiced, and, and they got it from previous cultures that live in the Andes, is that what's called by uh, anthropologists the vertical archipelago, which uh, means that as you climb an elevation, the temperature changes. As the temperature changes, the flora and fauna change. And here's like just some examples of, um, you know, down here at the Amazon rain jungle. Here we're at Lake Titicaca, it's like 1,200, 12,000 feet and so on all the way up to the glaciated areas. But you can grow different crops at different levels. And if you have access to those different levels, then you can have a blizzard or something terrible happen at one of these elevations, but you have, um, you have things planted that would be safe. So here's just some of the examples of crops that can be grown at different elevations going up the side of the Andes. And the Incas and the Pre-Incas took advantage of this and so they might have a, a village down in some lowland valley, but they would have trails and they would be harvesting and cultivating all these different crops all the way up to snow line. You know, there's nothing to, you know, uh, to walk, walk up 2,000, 3,000, 5,000, you know, uh, feet elevation and go harvest stuff and bring it back. So they were masters at cultivating this really um, extreme environment. Here's kind of a diagram of like the vertical archipelago. Yeah, these kind of like little oases of different things you can cultivate and maybe a village way down at the bottom that would go up and down, up and down and cultivate those things. And the principle behind that is you don't have all your eggs in one basket, right? Because if you grew everything at one level and you had a drought or a blizzard and wiped everything out, then you would be out of luck. So they were masters at that. So much so that if you haven't been to Peru, um, this is a town called Mo Morai, which is outside of uh, Cusco. Near, in this, near the Sacred Valley. And archeologists believe that this was an agricultural experimental station. Um, it looks like a UFO landing site, but it's an agricultural experimental station. And the range in temperatures in this spot from down to up here to up here, it could range 30 to 50 degrees on a typical day. So they would practice cultivating um, different cultivars from across the empire. They would experiment and see, well, well, if we're growing, you know, cotton grows at a certain elevation down there, can we grow it at different elevations up here? And they would experiment. And there's, they've done archaeological tests, and sure enough, they were doing all this experimentation here. So they're, and this is the scale of this place. These are people right here, and it's not the only one. There's a whole bunch of these scattered around. So they not only experimented, uh, as did pre-Inca people, but they experimented in a very rigorous way in expanding their knowledge of uh, horticulture and also they were doing the same thing with llamas and alpacas. There's never been such fine fleece on an alpaca since the days of the Incas because they had done specialized breeding. And also because they're an agricultural society, they, um, um, they needed to know when they needed to plant because the seasons are very extreme and they, there's a lot of times there's not a big window of opportunity to get your seeds in and get your harvest out. So therefore the Incas were huge on observatories and their main God was the sun God. This is the observatory um, there in Cusco. Uh, below a Spanish church. That was uh, Cori Cancha, that was the central uh, sun temple of the Incas. And often they have this kind of rounded architecture. This is a sun temple in Machu Picchu. Um, and these are scattered throughout the empire. And, and for a long time, this is the inside of that sun temple in Machu Picchu. They didn't really know what, you know, what, was, what it was doing there, but somebody showed up on a solstice there one day, not that long ago, 20, 30 years ago. And they saw that the light came through and bisected this, this um, this carving right here in the middle, and they realized it was an astronomical observatory and it marked this different solstices because when they knew that, they knew what their calendar was, they could spread the word through their Chosky runners, it's time to plant. So they marked the equinoxes also in, 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 uh, in Cusco on the skyline. They put a pillars up there to mark the uh, different months of the year. So you could look up when you lived in Cusco up on the hills and you'd see what month it was and the planning schedule and that kind of thing. Um, and the whole empire was based on, it was a theocratic empire and they were polytheistic, meaning they had an assortment of gods, the, the main one being the sun god, but here's they had moon god and earth, earth god and creator god and that kind of thing. And then when they would conquer different peoples, they would often incorporate, if they had been conquered peacefully, um, their gods into their pantheon. So they had a really stratified society, which was a theocracy. The head of the, 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 the society was both the emperor and the god, um, just like in Egypt and elsewhere. So it was 
quite a, all the power was consolidated into one individual. And that was all based then on, on the uh, farming, the peasants at the bottom. In the middle of all that, as I mentioned, um, where all these, the Tiwantin Suyo, the four quarters of the empire, they all intersected right in the center there in the town of Cusco. And here's where they, they had different roads. That they had a road that went up to the northern quadrant, a road went up to the eastern quadrant, and so on. These roads actually met right here where there's now the central square of Cusco, which was larger during Inca time. So not only was it bisected by Cusco, but they had a big ceremonial square where these roads, which are still extant, enter the city of Cusco. And back in the day, um, Cusco would have looked like this. There's two streams here. It was actually laid out in the form of a of a lion, like a mountain lion, a phalene figure, which is a runs through Peruvian history, you know, powerful god. And here was a sense ceremonial plaza where the roads came in. That's what it would have looked back with the houses in there. And this is a, a town for here's the 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 uh, the phalene figure laid out um, on present day Cusco there with the big plaza de armas, which is the big ceremonial center there. And that's where the sun temple was, and but it was built in that kind of shape, like a, a puma. And um, it was surrounded by agriculture. And that was a temple. This was a city for the elite. This was a city for the, the emperor and the nobles and the administrators. Um, and then it was surrounded by agricultural terraces. And they went to know, uh, uh, they didn't cut any corners um, on decking it out with some of the best uh, stonework in the entire empire. And they had 12 different styles there. And it's still one of the reasons people visit Peru is just to see the stonework of the Incas. I showed this before, but it's still a marvel and it's still standing there after 500 years of earthquakes. That's the, the uh, sun temple there at the uh, Temple of the Sun there in Cusco. And they brought all kinds of specialists. They brought metallurgists in, the finest metallurgists from around the empire, from different cultures. They all lived in Cusco or lived outside of Cusco and they produced weavings and, and uh, metal smithing. And you know, weaving is an ancient art in, in South America. In fact, they said that it wasn't until the late 1800s that European textiles surpassed the, the fineness of, of textiles from Peru 2000 years ago. They're like one of the masters in the world of textiles, they still are. This would have been a tunic from a noble back in the, back in the day that would, with all kinds of symbols that nobody knows what they mean anymore, but you can see really beautiful. And if you had been a person walking in the street, you would have understood what all those symbols meant and what the rank was and where they were from in the empire and that kind of thing. Women were, um, this is the, the queen, the Inca had a, there was the Inca emperor and the Inca queen and the Inca queen was a very powerful woman as well. And uh, this is some of the clothing she would have worn, the finest alpaca linen, the fine, and vicuña, which is a, a wild animal has the finest fleece in the world, vicuña hair. And the conquistador said that the women in, in, in Cusco are the most beautiful in the empire and the, and the best, best dressed. This is a festival outside of Cusco. Um, so by the end of those 6,000 years of history, you know, little by little from those very first people crossing over the Bering Strait, whether in kayaks or on foot, after thousands and thousands of years, um, they erected eventually kingdoms and agriculture and metallurgy and all these things. Um, and um, I'm almost at the end here, so uh, bear with me. These are this is that map of the different emperors. And in roughly late early 1500s, um, there was an emperor there called Huayna Capac, and he'd conquered this whole area down to the south. And when he was down there after he conquered, he got word from his chasqui runner that there was a rebellion up in the north. Um, so he got on his litter and they carried him 2,000 some miles up to the north so he could put down that rebellion. And this is the Hanging Inca Bridge. Some of them are still extant. They're famous for that. They, they would bridge the chasms with that. But they would travel this way. So this fellow traveled 2,000 miles to find out what the rebellion was all about. All about. And while he was there putting down that rebellion, a uh, Chasqui runner showed up one day and said, on the coast of the northern, what's now northern Peru, something very strange had been seen. There was a really big... Uh, a couple of ships and very strange people on the ships. They had like white, light colored skin and they had sticks that, that blew out fire and smoke and they weren't very friendly. And what should they do? And uh, that was referring to the, the very first voyage of Francisco Pizarro um, and his very first, uh, Pizarro did three trips to Peru. The very first one was exploratory. And they stopped there for a little bit and saw their first uh, vestige of uh, on the second one, actually, the second voyage, 
uh, saw the first um, inkling that there was an, an ink, there was an empire there. And so they were wearing armor and they had some horses and, and nobody had ever seen anything like that. So um, Wayne Kapak, the emperor, had to decide what was this all about and what should he do? And that brings the current talk to an end because the second talk is all about what he did. <laughs> what happened when the Spaniards came, right? The, um, what happened when 168 Spaniards came down and encountered an empire of 10 million people? So that wraps up the, the kind of the backstory. That was kind of a rush through, what do you want to look at? 300,000 years of history or 6,000 years of, of South American history since agriculture. Um, but the whole idea there was to show that the Incas were just the last layer on top of 6,000 years of previous cultures, right? They took, they took advantage of all the, all the inventions that had been painstakingly produced by all the cultures that had come before them. So they, did, they didn't just come out of the blue and UFOs did presumably not come down and help them out. They didn't need that help to do what they did. As you can see, there was a lot of, they were standing on the shoulders of, of, of one of the deepest layers of multiple civilizations of any place on the planet. So I'm gonna turn it back to you, Karen. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Kim, for that great lecture. It was amazing. It was so great going through all of that history of pre-Columbian Peru with you. Um, we did receive a few questions from the audience, so I'm gonna go ahead and, and start with those. If you would like to ask a question, there is still time to do so. So please just leave a question um, on Facebook Live or in the Zoom Q&A feature. Um, we, our first question comes from, it's a similar question that we had on both Zoom and on from someone from Facebook. And it kind of goes back to the very beginning of your lecture when you were talking about your time with the Yora um, people. And so people are asking, what was the means of communication that you had with this tribe and, um, or what language did you use to communicate with them? Did you have to use a, a translator or, or how were you able to communicate with them? Yeah, they were, they were monolingual at the time. I mean, they spoke their own language, Yaminawa. And so I learned enough of that to be able to communicate. You know, I took, uh, there was like a lexicon and, 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 and I was able to communicate. Unfortunately, it wasn't a super difficult language. I had a friend there was an anthropologist and he lived, he studied with a tribe that was nearby called the Machigengas. And the Machigengas have a agglutinative language, meaning that to say like the word water, you'd have like 14 syllables. And, and <laughs> I always admired him that he could do that. But so, yeah, I learned to speak their language because they, they, they were monolingual. Time. That's wonderful. That's really interesting. That's really, really interesting. Um, another question that we have um, from Zoom is, what is the most impressive archaeological site you've visited anywhere in the world? Well, that's that's a good question. Um, and I haven't seen all the world, but I mean, there's some top favorites. I mean, obviously, Inca ruins are one of them, definitely. Um, and there's some amazing pre-Inca ruins, you know, scattered here and there. You know, Angkor Wat's pretty phenomenal. The Egyptian pyramids. I mean, there's just you know, we, uh, my wife and I took a went around the world uh, for a year and visited a lot of these these amazing places. You know, at our leisure, and the the result of that year of travel was like you just realize that how many fantastic places there are on the planet. What an amazing planet it is, and how many of these these cultures that have those str stratified layers of history of what the, with the marbles that they built. So. There, there's and I, and I have never been to China and seen any of that stuff there. So there's I, there's still more to come, but I would say this Peru is, is always you know near and dear to my heart. But it's also one of the biologically, culturally, historically, it's one of those it's one of those most amazing places on the planet for all those reasons just said. So that's that certainly counts among the top top ones. So if you haven't gotten, you should go. Definitely, I agree. <laughs> it's a wonderful place. You won't regret it. <laughs> Another question that we have is. Um, is uh, from another audience member, an anonymous audience member, and they would like to know um, of all the Inca archeological sites in Peru, which one do you consider the most significant in terms of its importance to the Inca? Well, that's also, it's a good question, you know. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, obviously Cusco is, was, you know, Cusco, what do you say? It's like, they, um, you know, people tend to, you know, Rome, obviously, if you were to say, of all the Roman Empire, what's the most amazing thing? Well, the Romans put everything, they didn't put everything, but they they made sure that Rome had some of the most spectacular stuff because that was the seat of power. Cusco is, is the equivalent of that, but um, there's bits and pieces of the Inca Empire scattered all over. And, and sometimes for me, some of the most interesting are the ones that are on the far fringes, 
It's almost like in the Roman Empire, you had the Hadrian's Wall way up in, you know, in Scotland, and that's kind of fascinating in its own way. It's so far from Rome, and yet here's this, you know, this structure there that they, you know, is part of that empire. And and and, and the Incas are, I've seen ruins all the way down, you know, way down in Bolivia and all the way up into, you know, Ecuador and, and you know, bits of it in the Amazon jungle. And in a way, that's always kind of stunning even to see the remains, remains there. But if you had to pick one place, I would say Cusco. Obviously, Machu Picchu is is for for also a seat of power, and that was a citadel back in the day. So that's still. But there's, if you do the Inca Trail, you will see there's tons of ruins along the way. You know, they're just all over the place. So I don't think they answer the question other you should go to Peru. <laughs> Check them out. That's true. Come to Peru and find out for yourself which one you think is the most there's important. So much stuff to, to 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 marvel at. Definitely, even within Cusco. I mean, all of Cusco is just such an impressive archaeological well of of information and history it's it's really great to see okay so i guess we we're running short on time so i'll just ask one more question um the one uh, one more that we have is they say that inca stonework is really unique do you know of any other cultures who are able to achieve this level of precision and forethought since most of these the majority of these ancient structures were also built to withstand earthquakes yeah, the, a good question. Um, the, I guess the, if you go to Tiwanaku, which was a thousand years before the Incas, that's what that's really stands out because you realize a lot of the techniques the Incas were using, they got from the Tiwanaku culture. One way, you know, the remnants of the Tiwanaku culture, and and a lot of a lot of the techniques that Incas had, you can see where they cut into stone. You put two stones together, you cut it. Uh, um, a channel between them, and you put like a bronze pin in between. Well, the 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 Chima, the the, um, the Tiwanaku culture was using that beforehand. But if you go to Egypt and you see the the stone pyramids made by the Egyptians, you know, uh, three thousand, two thousand year, you know, years before Christ, those are pretty amazing too. So they're they're obviously well up on their game in those places. So you know, Angkor Wat, you know, they were cutting stone left, right, and center. So these different cultures that they're around long enough and for stone around. And they have a stratification and they have enough time to spend there then they they figured out you know around the world how to how to work marbles with with stone including the romans and greeks and whatnot but again i don't know if i answered the question but yeah they were certainly masters and one reason people go there is that nobody really built as beautiful walls i mean tiwanaku could cut stone as well that culture but the inca walls somehow are just beautiful the, they're stylized there's different styles there and they're just like there's a, a the inca culture had a really strong aesthetic. Um, and one other thing I'll just throw in there real quickly is I, I have a archeologist friend who spent a lot of time down in Peru. And he said, you know what? He goes every, and he's, he's an architect. He goes, every architecture has a message and the Incas have a very strong one. And he says, you know what that is? I said, no, he goes, the, the message is a job worth doing is worth doing well. There's like, there's no, you know, you don't look behind an Inca stone and find a, a, a lousy job behind there. They didn't cut any corners. They didn't do a lousy job on the back of the facing or the under facing. It was just like perfection. You know, culturally, they were into aesthetics and and you know, a culture of perfection. So that that's lasted lasted the test of time. That's why we still go there. Definitely, definitely. I mean, you can still see it in and how vibrant that culture still exists in Peru as well today. So it's great to see how how that still hasn't been lost, even though Peru has definitely changed since the Inca times. Um, well, I guess I will, before I sign off, I do want to say we have a comment from one of our audience mem members, Joseph Bays, who says, wonderful lecture. Thank you so much. He also loves your book. He's read it. And they filled in a lot of gaps for him and his wife when they went to Peru. So oh. I thought I would share that message um, from Joseph. Thanks. Well, um, I, I guess I would go ahead and like to thank you, Kim, so much for joining us again today. We really appreciate you sharing your knowledge on pre-Columbian Peru with us. And we're still looking forward to the next one next week. Awesome. Well, thanks very much to you. Thanks for, thanks for having me and, and uh, we'll see you uh, next time. Okay, wonderful. Uh, I will also go ahead and like to thank Peru for Less and Inca Expert Travel for hosting this great event and everyone who joined us on Zoom and Facebook Live today as well. We really appreciate you being here with us. Uh, like I said, our next event will be next Saturday, uh, September, I mean, October 24th at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern time with Kim McQuarrie again talking about the conquest of the Inca Empire. So thanks so much, everyone, and, and have a wonderful afternoon.